You know, uh, for a long time, I, I, I'm not speaking for you, Emma, I'm speaking for myself. I was um, hesitant to criticize uh, Glenn Greenwald in a sort of general way, because um, for a long time, I had a lot of respect for the work that he did. Um, not just, uh, you know, uh, people can make, uh, have issues about, um, you know, whether how much reporting he did, he was, you know, forge it, whatever. He was a very, um, I thought, strong voice for uh, a decade or so. And uh, I and, totally agree with you. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I think it's quite possible I gave him his first uh, you know, uh, nationwide uh, media hit on Air America uh, back in the day. Uh, very possible. Probably likely, actually. Um, and uh, he was a guy I really appreciated. I would see that, you know, he would get under people's uh, skin. And uh, but it was all, I think, like, you know, I think he did it in a in a thoughtful way. And and then things started going off the, the rails a little bit. There was um there's been criticism over the years that has sort of like made me sort of like, uh, you know, question certain things. It was a, um, it was a Twitter. I think he's gone now. I think it was a, a he, uh, a Rancid Tarzi, who was very critical of, of Greenwald for the way that he monetized the um, Snowden uh, information. And that I, was I just, I, to me, that's more okay. But the reporting was, so well, brave that it's just like we all yeah, monetize and, and, our and, stuff. And, I mean, yeah, I understand. I mean, but it, I'm 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 just sort of giving the evolution of sort of like, um, and uh, certainly the stuff that he did down in uh, in in you know he's talking about uh, Lula here and in Brazil, um, under a lot of threat from the uh, from the the Bolsonaro regime, um, uh, but that was you know was, over time things became a little bit sideways and i think he got very upset when he got when he was critical of obama and got bumped more or less from uh you know msnbc where he would go on to uh, the shows some of the shows that i would never that i wouldn't go on uh but and uh and then you know we are in jay johnstone territory on some level here uh where things go off the rails a little bit here he is on a daily caller show Ostensibly, he, pre he approaches these audiences um, uh, to, I, I mean, I don't know what he's, you know, what he's supposedly going on there, but I don't know how you can defend these statements as being anything other than disingenuous. Um, here it is, it's a long clip. Do we have to play the whole thing to get the context? Um, we can move through it, I guess. Okay, but all right, it, start playing it. It's we should different parts of the democratic world. And I'm going to touch a little bit on the comments you just made about the evolution of the center left in Brazil. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe your husband is affiliated with the Socialism and, and Liberty Party. That's correct, right? I think you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, that's, that's exactly correct. OK, no, I just want to double check before I ask this. So why do you think the idea of socialism, both as it's framed by the right and the left in America, you know, varies so drastically from what we've seen in, you know, Brazil, other Latin American countries, even countries in Europe. Is that just because of, you know, the, the, the huge play that identity politics has in America? I'm curious about that distinction and how it's evolved into something that doesn't really look like socialism anywhere else in the world, at least in my opinion. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. I mean, in Brazil, for instance, the Workers' Party was founded by Lula. Uh, he grew up in extreme poverty. He was, uh, I think, the eighth of nine children. He was illiterate until the age of 10. He went to work in a factory, famously lost one of his fingers, became a very charismatic labor leader, um, and ran for president three times, and almost won more or less each of the three times, but didn't. And then the fourth time he ran in 2002, he realized, like, if I want to get elite sectors of society, not completely against me, but even kind of comfortable, I need to moderate my economic policy. And so he ran as his vice presidential running mate with a banker, an actual, you know, pause austerity it. advocate. To pause it for a quick. Pause it. So I have this Brian Mayer from Telesaur. Um, 
No, Glenn. Lula's VP was not an austerity advocating banker, as you told the Daily Caller. He was a textile factory owner turned senator who economically was a center right Keynesian and olive branch to business elites, yes, but not a banker. So go on. That's a weird mistake to make. It's not a mistake, right? I mean, it's like part of he's trying to he's trying to build up the narrative. He's about but I to mean, say. how does he think he's going to get away with that? It's just a weird mistake to make. Because he's on the Daily Caller. I guess. But go ahead banker just to calm international markets and make people less concerned about what his presidency would look like. And when he got into to power, you know, people were petrified that he was going to become like Cuba or Venezuela. He was a supporter of, of Chavez and, and Castro. But he always said, my form of leftism is not the one that erodes civil liberties. It's, it's not communism. I believe that there should be a free market. We need that to generate growth. I just believe in a more equitable distribution of resources. And he innovated these social programs that even you know, kind of like think tanks, capitalist think tanks and journals like The Economist to this day praise, um, including one where uh, women who are single mothers who are raising children get a monthly payment as long as they can demonstrate that their children have been vaccinated and are regularly going to school. So it incentivizes them to make sure their children aren't lost into the society um, or doing the things that make them healthy and educated. And only then do they get this payment. Um, Pause it for one second. Brazilian Just be clear gross, what that I, is. Just be clear what that is, right? I mean, I mean, can you imagine the outrage in this country if vaccinations for COVID were tied in with a government payment. Yeah. And also, I mean, let's honestly, just let me just quickly say, too, um, this is sped up 1.5. Right. Yeah. We sped yeah. it up just yeah. a little bit. OK. Now, here comes the pivot. Go. I rocketed under Lula. Uh, the rich did very well and got very comfortable with him, which is why he overwhelmingly got elected. I think that's what really what you're seeing. I mean, obviously, the word socialist carries a lot of baggage from the Cold War. It evokes on purpose the Soviet Union or uh you know castro or or chavez um pol pot people like that kind of the mall um but i think what you're seeing is this kind of uh hybrid socialism that really is about nothing more than mm. trying to sandpaper the edges off of neoliberalism and i you know would describe a lot of people on the right as being socialist. I would consider Steve Bannon to be a socialist. I would consider the, the 2016 iteration of Donald Trump, the candidate, to be a socialist, based on what he was saying. I consider Tucker Carlson to be a socialist. You know, now if you have uh, Governor Cuomo... We don't need to go much further. I, I can't watch anymore. Well, I mean, here's the thing, is that first off, shaving the uh, the edges off of neoliberalism, I mean, and and I don't... I, I think most people who listen to this show, and I don't think that most socialists would consider me a socialist. Um, you know, maybe I'm, a, a, I guess, a what is this, a sock dem or something. But the idea that a socialist is just looking to shave off the rough, rough edges of neoliberalism is just absurd. And the idea that in any way there was any, like what proposals did Donald Trump or Steve Bannon, or does Tucker Carlson ever made that come even remotely close to what they're talking about? I mean, you want to talk about payments to um, people uh, who have children. Well, you can look at the $1.9 trillion bill that was just passed, where there's going to be, over the course of the year, if you have children under age six, you're going to get $3,600 over the course of the year. They may dole it out, not quite clear yet, $300 a month or something to that effect. Uh, six to 18, three thousand dollars. It's one year. Biden has already said publicly that he is in favor of extending this and trying to increase that, you know, have it go longer. And and certainly there's Democratic support for this. And I don't know that anybody would call that. I mean, it's a socialistic policy, but I don't well, know anybody would call Joe Biden a socialist. He's deliberately conflating anti-establishment rhetoric or like the perception of populism, which is what Steve Bannon and Donald Trump represent and Tucker Carlson cosplays in with socialism. I mean, that's not a political argument. That's like an aesthetic. That's the most aesthetic surface level argument I can think of. And it's tracking it, it, it's it tracks with what the the media the mainstream media that Glenn critiques engages in where it's like purely how people posture themselves and devoid of, uh, of what's connected to policy. I mean, it's absurd. Yeah. I mean that, that I, the truth, 
I would one like to get someone from the Socialism and Liberty Party um, from Brazil on that to maybe answer that question a little bit better than Glenn Greenwald would, because I wonder because he's speaking in the name of his partner's uh, political party, and frankly, I wonder what they think about that. Um, but here's the other question: Who is that for? Because you know, I would I like I. It is not impossible for me to imagine that. Glenn's argument is like, well, I, I'm on there and I'm, I'm talking to a, a right wing audience and I am trying to um, to convince them that the word socialism isn't so uh, dangerous. And that, that I could I could I can imagine. Defenders of him or him himself saying that, but let's be let's be um, clear. Glenn Greenwald knows that we're going to play that clip. Glenn Greenwald knows that that clip is going to travel. I don't even know that we're going to play it, but he knows that that clip's going to travel, right? Like, you know, he understands how social media works. He understands how media works. They, you know, people aren't uh, silly. He knows who's going to get that attention. Well, you ask yourself, is he going to convince right-wing people that, and what is the value of right-wing people thinking that Steve Bannon's a socialist or that um, Donald Trump's a socialist, or that Tucker Carlson's a socialist. Like, what is the value if I'm a right winger and I you've convinced me, Glenn, they're socialists? Do I embrace socialism, or do I just keep supporting those guys and maybe think that the other right wingers, you know, maybe they I like them too? Well, it this it's, is to... designed for a left wing audience. This is designed to convince. And I think that, you know, he throws in Bannon and Trump maybe is it to convince people Tucker Carlson's your guy to play off of his populism, his critique of of corporatism. And that that's what it's designed to do. That's what it's designed to do. And 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 Glenn is sophisticated and smart enough to know what he's doing. That's my yeah. I think like the way he runs interference for Josh Hawley's minimum wage thing. And then he, yeah, he wants to obscure the actual. By the left way, Josh Hawley just voted against the minimum wage. Of course, of course he did. But like, the, 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 it seems like Glenn has this project I'm beginning to see pronounced that is to obscure what the actual left is saying. And I mean, yeah, exactly. Like the, and, and to say that all those leftists that don't consider Bannon and Tucker like the socialist and see the actual, you know, force for the trees like I do, they're doing it wrong. And that left is this cancel culture. They, they probably like, you know, watch MSNB, DNC. Like that's the, that's the message he wants to send. That's the attitude he's conveying now. And understand what that response, that entire response was a function of identity politics. The question was about identity politics. And it leads him to say the real socialists are Bannon, Trump, and Tucker Carlson. This is, I mean, this is a project that he's got. I mean, make no mistake about it. It is a project. I, I don't know what, what what is behind this. It's very like, sad. It's very it, sad. I don't, I like that. I take no, I have no joy in just like, you know. Well, I, I take no joy in it, but I don't feel any sadness anymore. I'm, I'm, do, I'm like that, that, that. That's, you're, the, you're in a, you're in a new stage. I'm do we have stage. his border comments? Do we have the, like, is there immigration comments later or don't we have that? Or am I misremembering that? Are they, I just like, I don't understand how someone can be someone who had such, you know, I think broke through the media in such a very profound way and was, you know, a really strong voice, maybe not even a leftist voice, but anti-establishment in a constructive way can like be so warped by online culture that this is what we see. I mean, and it's like a, it's a phenomenon that we've seen now a few times. It's like Michael Tracy's a, a, a great example, but like never thought that would be Glenn. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Glenn Greenwald had his political awakening during the Iraq war. So he says, which is the same time I did. And he's 20 years older than me. So I don't know. His work in unauthorized disclosure is good, but his commentary, I think has always been a bit. Eh. I mean, there, I, 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 it, it some of the stuff that he had, uh, you know, and he was uh, critical of, uh, of corporate Democrats, too, at that time. But there was, you know, and, and the, 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 the I, I, I putting aside like where he came from, I don't know. I just saw Jay Johnstone, you know, uh, pictures of Jay Johnstone, like, I, you know, who knows how what happens in people's lives and where they go and whatnot. 
But now, like, you know, for me, like I'm going to uh, assess what he is saying as someone who has an audience of of maybe decreasing uh, leftists, but still uh, some audience and some um, currency with people on the left. And, you know, the only upside is and maybe he knows it like he lost a lot of real socialists with that comment, like legitimate socialists. Uh, He lost them. He is going for, you know, these these uh, disaffected sort of, um, you know, uh, 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 progressives who maybe have a tough time with, you know, sort of so-called woke culture, uh, whatever that is, cancel culture. The idea that maybe, you know, he is going for the same, um, you know, uh, uh, a crowd of people that uh, Jordan Peterson's going for. He's just providing them a slightly different product. Oh, he's engaging with like Brett Weinstein and stuff on Twitter now. It's, and, right, yeah. There you go. 